Well, you'll hear about a lot of products today, and I have nothing to disclose. I don't know about you, but every time I hear this, I feel the speaker trying to say something like, I'm open to any other offers, <laughs> or I need a raise, hashtag Dr. Lumsden. Uh, uh, so no, I'm, uh, I'm just kidding. You'll see me protected, OK? So now that you're awake, uh, there are a lot of redundancies, so I'll go s through some slides very quickly. D-vein thrombosis, very common, 50% is silent. They break, they cause pulmonary embolism. The main treatment of pulmonary embolism is prevention. But you are vascular surgeons or interventionalists that you'll be called to treat when it's already happened, so already, it's already too late. Just I want to emphasize something that the other speakers already mentioned. Annual incidence of pulmonary embolism is 530,000 a year and more than a million in Europe. And that's causing 200,000 deaths in the U.S. annually, which is more deaths than AIDS, motor vehicle crashes, and breast cancer combined. So if you're thinking of having a career of saving lives as a trauma surgeon, rethink again. Just treat PEs. Um, you have to understand the pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism to know what we're targeting. And that's where you will see the difference between what Dr. Rickbert mentioned. Pulmonary embolism increases your uh, pulmonary val uh, vein resistance. That causes right ventricular overload, which causes hypokinesia of the right ventricle, which dilates at the same time that decreases the right ventricle cardiac output and pushing the septum towards the left ventricle. Now you have left volu less volume in the left ventricle with less space, and now that decreases your uh, cardiac output, left ventricular cardiac output, which causes decreased perfusion of the coronaries, causing more ischemia, more damage, less, more hy hypokinesia of the heart. So now you have hypotension and irreversible damage. So the worst combination when it's a big clot causing hemodynamic instability. This is very, very important because it's, it's misunderstood the, the uh, definition of pulmonary embolism. So we have massive, submassive, and minor. And it's not the size of the clot. Massive pulmonary embolism, yes, it's a large clot, but it's the one that causes hypotension, systolic blood pressure less than 90. And it's very, it has very high mortality, 58% within 90 days. The submassive, which is 40% of the pulmonary embolism, it can be still a large clot, but the patient is hemodynamically stable, no hypotension. However, the right ventricle is under uh, distress and dysfunction based on echo. And the minor one, mo most of the patients don't even know about it, and they, they don't know until the second hit, which comes with some pleuritic uh, pain or mild tachycardia. Clinical presentation, Dr. Rickberg mentioned these, the shortness of breath. What I want to mention is the possibility of massive PE. Who do you suspect it when we're talking about useless clinical exam or the CT scan can be done uh, faster than you can walk to the ER? is sudden onset of near syncope or syncope, hypertension, extreme hypoxemia, or EKG changes with somebody with chest pain. You go through the biomarkers, you have suspicion, you do the imaging. So now this is where I would like to uh, deviate from Dr. Rickberg's thought about we don't need to treat PE. Why do we need to be aggressive actually in treating PEs. Right ventricle to left ventricle ratio, more than 0.9 dilatation right ventricle, is independent predictor of mortality. And patients who have persistent right ventricle dysfunction on discharge, they have eight times more likely to have another PE and four more times to have mortality, to die. And from the patients who, who survive this, 44% of those will have pulmonary hypertension. So the patient who have Evidence on echo, right ventricle distress on echo, when they discharge home, although they're hemodynamically stable and asymptomatic, 89% uh, of, uh, uh, sorry, 57% of them still have high risk of mortality. And anticoagulation, as we mentioned, doesn't dissolve the clot, it just stops it from propagating. So what's the, what are the guidelines? If you have massive pulmonary embolism, somebody with hypotension, it's IV thrombolytics, 100 milligrams TPA over uh, two hours. Then you adjunct it with endovascular embolectomy or pharmacomechanical intervention if needed, if the IV by itself didn't work, and then surgical embolectomy as uh, the last resort. It has high morbidity. What about the submassive? The submassive is still saying, the guidelines say systemic anticoagulation. 
However, we just talked about the right ventricle distress caused by the submassive PE is not treated with anticoagulation, and those patients will have high mortality and high morbidity, although they were asymptomatic when they left home. So this is an algorithm we're not going to go into through, but, but what I want you to focus on, okay, the patient came, he has mass, he had massive PE, you screen them for contraindication of anticoagulation and you find none, so you give them the IV thrombolytics. Actually, studies found that those patients who were negative and there's no contraindication to have uh, IV thrombolytics, 20% of them still developed hemorrhage. And that hemorrhage, 3 to 5% was intracranial. That's devastating. So what about systemic fibrinolytics treatment? They work. They improve right ventricular function. They increase the pulmonary perfusion. They lower the incidence of recurrent PE. However, they have high ch chance of bleeding up to 22%. So the catheter-directed uh, thrombolysis was trending in, and many papers came and proved that it works. And one of the logic I like about this study, this study was done in Germany on animals, where the investigator ligated one of the pulmonary arteries or placed a balloon and gave uh, thrombolytics. And, what, what he, and then he crushed glass and injected it in, in blood and found that the glass pieces go to the open pulmonary embolism. So if you have PE on one side and you give medication IV thrombolytics, it will prefer the open side. That makes sense in, for catheter-directed thrombolysis. The, the other thing you do with catheter, you're creating channels and holes in that clot that breaks it and let the medication go through it as well. What are the modalities? Uh, one of them is called the pigtail rotational catheter. You just put a pigtail in the pulmonary artery, rotate it, marsipulate the clot, and come out. Cheap, simple, doesn't work by itself because you will still need some fun. I think it's marsipulate. Marsipulate is Mars like when you turn it into a kangaroo. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. As you see, English is not my strength. Uh, NGJet, you know, that machine that uh, suction out the clot, do not use it. There is a warning on the catheter itself that it's not meant to be used for pulmonary embolism. Uh, helix thrombectomy, it's a device that's used for the AV graft thrombectomies. Uh, it's been used off-label for PE. And that's another uh, catheter. It's called the Asperex catheter. It works the same way. It rotates, creating negative uh, pressure, suction in the clot out. It's used off-label for PE as well. The only FDA-approved treatment of uh, PE uh, is the catheter-infused uh, TPA. And it can be just drug-infusing catheter, like unifused catheter, or it can be drugs that the catheter that uses an ultrasound accelerated technique. And they compared both catheters and found that the ultrasound accelerated catheters increases the exposure of the thrombus to TPA 48% in one hour and 89% in four hours. And the way it works, this is the clot, this, these are the fibrin strands. The ultrasound um, kind of loosen up the fibrin strands and exposes more thrombus to the TPA and pushes the medication into the clot, which causes uh, more effectiveness of the clot without hemolysis or valve damage that you see with the NG jet. And there are papers that compare the difference between ECOS and just catheter direct thrombolysis, and it proves superiority. I'm not going to go through this due to time. And there are two randomized trials for the ECOS uh, that uh, were compared for the submassive PE, the first one, compared heparin versus heparin and ECOS, and showed superiority of uh, ECOS in one restoring right ventricular function, taking out the mortality and morbidity out of the PE. This is the results of the Ultima uh, and showed significant reduction in administration of TPE. In a, in instead of 100 milligrams, they administered only 18 milligrams. And there is a third now trial. This is the second one, the Seattle trial. They involve the massive PE as well. Still showed the same thing, reduction of the right ventricle distress and resolution of the findings on echocardiogram at the end of the study. There's a third study that's ongoing right now where saying that all you need is eight milligrams of TPA. Put the ECOS catheter, leave it for eight hours only, and pull the catheters out. And it's ongoing, and apparently so far the results are encouraging. IVC filter, we have to say a word or two about IVC filter. 
when are they indicated? Iliofemoral DVT extending into the uh, vena cava with absolute contraindication to full anticoagulation. And there are controversial indications that use your medical judgment kind of thing. Oh, it's big DVT, uh, poor cardiopulmonary reserve, recurrent VT, um, or failed therapy on anticoagulation. They're controversial. However, JAMA reviewed about 1,000 patients retrospectively and found that only 50% of the retrievable IVC filter that we put, we take out. So we have to do a better job. I put this slide because they love to ask this question on the in-service and the general surgery oral boards. Pregnant woman with DVT. The V side question always, do not choose warfarin. It's contraindicated in pregnant women. Uh, it causes birth defects and do not use the new drugs that Dr. Silva talked about in pregnant women. So that's the answer. For the general surgery oral board, they like to ask the scenario, uh, lady, a pregnant lady comes with DVT, what do you wanna do? So admit the patient to the hospital, start on heparin or Lovenox, watch her for a day or two for bleeding, elevation, compression, then send her home with a planned C-section or induction of labor. And the reason for that, you have exact time when you can stop the Lovenox. Don't wait for uh, natural uh, delivery. Then extend the treatment for six weeks after delivery and, and consider prophylaxis. Again, do not use the new drugs uh, with pregnant uh, ladies. Um, I wanted to show you a case that we did here at the Methodist. This 40-year-old uh, gentleman who's hypercoagulable came with shortness of breath after a flight from Kentucky. Uh, he has hysteropy in the past that was treated for nine months with uh, anticoagulation. His blood pressure was marginal, 97 over 52. Uh, the troponin 2.2 showing, uh, as a, again, uh, left ventricular and right ventricular uh, distress or dysfunction. This is the impressive one. The echocardiogram, the right ventricle already has moderately dilated and dysfunctional and already causing paradoxical septal movement and pushing in the left ventricle, decreasing the EF to 50 or 54%. We took the patient to the operating room with a pulmonary angiogram. You can see the clot on the right-hand side. We put two ECOS catheter uh, on each side. I don't know if you see the dots. This is how the patient will look like coming out. We have three drips, TPA, heparin, and coolant for the catheter. In this case, we put the, both of the catheters in the right groin. You can put it in, in two separate groins. But this technique is helpful if you have large clot on the other side. You can consider that. 16 hours later, uh, we, re we repeated the echocardiogram and all symptoms resolved. Right ventricle, left ventricle distress, uh, uh, dysfunction resolved with normal ejection fracture. At the beginning, we did post angiograms just to confirm. Uh, we don't do this anymore. Once the echo normalized, you can pull the catheters. This is like selective, left and right to see. Again, as you see, the clot resolved and the lung is perfusing very well. This is on the right side as well. The patient did well and went home on post-operative day four. Uh, so in conclusion, pulmonary embolism is lethal and preventable. The right ventricle dysfunction is the main cause of death and morbidity as well. Anticoagulation just stops the propagation of the clot but doesn't resolve it. And 33% of the patient who discharge with anticoagulation, they have ongoing uh, right ventricular dysfunction. Systemic thrombolytics, they work, but they can cause bleeding. And catheter-directed thrombolysis is safe and effective. Thank you. Yeah.